Hello and welcome to West Wind, an audio podcast about cancer, technology and medicine, and policy issues. I'm host and medical oncologist, Dr. Jack West, from the City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center in the Los Angeles area. You can find West Wind material at beaconmedic, one word, dot com, at iTunes, or just about anywhere you get podcast content. I would just ask that you show your interest and support by subscribing, commenting, sharing by telling friends and colleagues in person and on social media, and rating it however you feel is appropriate. You can also share your ideas and opinions by emailing us at westwindpodcast at gmail.com. We're continuing our discussion with Dr. Taufik Awanakoko, who is professor and attending physician, medical director of phase one clinical trials, and the co-director of thoracic oncology at Winship Cancer Institute, Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. So you did your postdoc at Johns Hopkins. Yeah. So what led you to go to Drexel and yeah. then your HEMOG fellowship at University of Pittsburgh? Was there a big transition in terms of what you wanted to do in life at that point? Yeah. So the funny thing is the reason why that advertisement was placed at my university in Dusseldorf was because the PI here at Hopkins used to be on faculty there in Dusseldorf. And he relocated to the U.S. like 10 years before, but the wife was still practicing in Dusseldorf. They're both husband and wife physician couple. So he used to come back there like maybe every three to six months, and the wife will come over here. So he's been looking for someone to work with them on his project in neuro-oncology, and he's not been able to find anyone because they wanted somebody with the pathology background and all whatnot. So that's actually why he put the adverts there to say, if anyone is interested, let them apply. So when I applied and I got here, it was a joint project between radiology and neuro-oncology, where they were trying to develop PET radio tracers for imaging tumor angiogenesis. So this was when anti-angiogenic agent is still very new. And Stuart Grossman, who is the chief of neuro-oncology at Hopkins, was leading the clinical side. And my direct boss, who was in radiology department, was leading the imaging side. And they needed someone in between, you know, who can do the experiment and also with the pathology background, with harvesting tissue, processing tissue, and reading the slide and stuff like that. So that was actually how I fit into that program. So I came in and I started my postdoc, but right from the get-go, I let him know that my primary interest is not 100% research. I will still want to go back into clinical practice. And at that point in time, I was thinking of going back to practice pathology. So I started doing the USMLE and all whatnot. But then I realized that if I go back to pathology, I'm still going to spend five years. There is no time credit for everything I've done. All the five years of training I've done before will count for nothing. I will still have to start right from the get-go. So that was when I said, you know what? Rather than go back to retrain and relearn the same thing for five years, I need to learn something different. So then, like I mentioned in the beginning, my interest in internal medicine then kicked in. I said, okay, I will go and do internal medicine, but the best thing to use my background in pathology is going to be oncology. So I actually decided I'm going to do oncology before I started residency. So then I applied and then I matched at um, Graduate Hospital for, of Drexel University in Philadelphia. So after two and a half years of postdoc training, I left and then went back into internal medicine training, which I enjoyed. It was a little bit of a struggle before because I've spent a lot of time in pathology, not so much in clinical medicine. So I had to like get used to being on call and, you know, ICU rotations and things like that. And, you know, inter clocking patient and which is, you know, something I haven't done in like five years. That was a struggle in the beginning. But, you know, you sort of get a hang of it and you you move on. But then when I was in the ICU, my ICU attending then, Dan Haber, he just took a liking to me. And it's like, you are so conscientious. I think you would be a great ICU physician. You know, he's a pulmonologist and ICU intensivist. So I said, Alan, I'm sorry. He said, I can pay attention to magnesium of 1.4, 
only for so long. After that, I lose interest. <laughs> that <laughs> when I'm here, because I know it's a short period of time I'm going to be here, I put everything into it to make sure I do a good job. But I don't see myself doing this day in, day out. I think I'll get burned out. I cannot do it. So I said, but the one thing I can promise you is the pulmonary aspect of this, I'm going to use it and I'm going to do thoracic oncology. No, that's interesting. I actually decided on doing thoracic oncology before I got into hematology and medical oncology, all because of my ICU attending when I was a resident. And then as fate would have it, so I interviewed everywhere and then I matched to UPMC program. And the first clinic they put me, I don't know how it happened. It was in Chandra Belani's clinic. So that sort of just sealed my fate. You know, it's like I'm coming in. I had in mind I'm going to do thoracic and then the clinic you put me into is uh, the thoracic clinic. And that was so right from my day one of fellowship. It was almost like I was doing thoracic oncology fellowship. Of course, I still rotated through everything else. But that was how I started, you know, attending all the meetings for thoracic oncology with Ram, with Chandra. And uh, it just took off from there. That's, <laughs> that's a great story. I want to ask, did you consider going back to Nigeria? I don't, I imagine you still had family there. Yeah. Or were you, you know, by the time you had gone to Germany and then to Hopkins and beyond, you were really committed to the idea of staying in the U.S.? Yeah. So, you know, part of the reason why I even decided to come was after my training when I was trying to go back, there were also some challenges in terms of where I was going back to in Nigeria, where my Nigerian boss also, he didn't want me to just come back and do my final exam. You know, unlike here, where once you're done with your training, you don't have to pass any exam other than, you know, if you want to be board certified, you can do it, but that doesn't mean you cannot practice, right? But it's not the same in Nigeria. You actually have to do a final exam to pass before you can practice as an attendant. So my boss then was like, no, I don't know what you've been doing for two years. And I wrote my thesis. I wrote everything. Apart from my PhD thesis for my PhD in Germany, I wrote a separate thesis for my fellowship exam in Nigeria. And for that, you needed your program director, so to say, to sign off to say you are ready for the exam. So he wouldn't sign off on that. Like, I need you to first come back. You have to come and spend another six months with me. And then let me see what you know, and then I can sign up. So that sort of uh, created some doubt and disappointment in my mind to say, you know, what is all this about, right? So that was actually the other reason why I had that impetus to send that original email. So once I made the decision to come here as a postdoc, that decision was already made like, I'm coming here to stay. At that point in time, did not have any mindset of going back anytime soon. In fact, there was a friend of mine we used to joke when I was in January, we used to tell him, no, I'm going back to Nigeria. I'm not staying in Europe. It's like, oh, it's a lie. You're kidding. Nobody does that. Everybody stays. And, you know, I always like tell him, no, I'm going back. Uh, but once I made that decision to come as a postdoc, because it's almost like I closed that door completely by not going back to spend six months with him and then do the exam. Given where I am now, I don't see myself going back to Nigeria to practice, but I do have plan to go back to at least contribute in some manner to medical, especially oncology development there. In actual fact, I'm leaving for Nigeria in two weeks with one of my colleagues here as part of our global oncology initiative. That's great. Yeah, where we're planning to establish some type of exchange program for people to come and go back. Now, can you tell me about where you met your wife? When was that? So I met my wife here. Uh, she's also Nigerian, but we met here. I didn't know her in Nigeria or anything. When I was in Philadelphia, I met her through a brother who was a pharmacy student then. And, you know, it was in a way one of those internet dating and everything else that goes along with it, where you have platform of where Nigerians meet and you talk and things like that. So he introduced me to his sister and then, you know, we sort of started talking and, you know, one thing led to the other and we figured out that we both share the same interests. We have the same background. She's Muslim and Muslim. 
we sort of both came from the same area of Nigeria, from the Southwest. We speak the same mother tongue. And so everything just sort of lined up. And so we got married during my fellowship. She came as a younger immigrant. Actually, she came here during our middle school with her family. And so she's been here much longer than I've been. And I'm lucky I found her because she also sort of helped me integrate better into the society than I would have done on my own. And is she working now? Yeah, so she works now part-time. She's a social worker. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, when we first started having family, she just took time to be with the kids. But now that the kids are much older, she's back now working part-time as a social worker. And uh, how many kids and how old are they? We have three kids, 12, 11, and 8. Do they speak the language uh, or are they (laughs) much more immersed in American life? Yeah, there you have it. So my middle daughter... I think she has the flair for language like me. She makes the most attempt to speak the language. We speak to them in Yoruba, which is our mother tongue. They understand, but they don't, they don't speak back to you in Yoruba. They will just reply you in English. So we at least try to speak that at home so that they can pick up on it. Uh, we also get them a teacher that puts them through the grammar for the language, tenses, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Have they been to Nigeria before, spent much time? Yeah. Do they have yeah. any identity that that? Yeah, they've been to Nigeria twice, and hopefully they will be going again next year. Okay. So we try to go every three, four years if everything works out. Now, after fellowship, you moved to Emory. I presume that that was a connection easily made from your prior work with Suresh Ramalingam, who has done amazing things at Emory. And obviously, that's been a a very good move for you. Can you talk about how that's gone over the last decade or so? Yeah, that's been, you know, times you make your career and other times they make your career for you. It's actually interesting how we both ended up at Emory. People may not know. So when I was a fellow, Ram was already a junior faculty at Pittsburgh. And Towards the end of my second year of fellowship, Chandra was leaving Pittsburgh to become the deputy director for Penn State. You know, there were, you know, some, just like at every other institution as well, you know, you have issues that you just feel like, if I can't resolve it, rather than make a scene, I'll just go somewhere else. So he was leaving Pittsburgh then, and he wanted Ram to go with him, right? But I think at that time, Ram didn't necessarily want to stay in that area. So he also started looking. And at least in retrospect, Fadlo said Pittsburgh was trying to recruit him, but he went there and recruited Ram. (laughs) 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 But sort of everybody was trying to play it safe. I did not know that Ram was interviewing at Emory. But I was starting my third year and I needed a job. And my wife didn't want to stay in Pittsburgh. She actually wanted to go back to Maryland, which is where her family is and everything else. So when Chandra offered me to come with him to Penn State, I said, I can't do that because my wife doesn't want to stay up here. But all the programs around Maryland at that time, all the academic programs, they did not have any thoracic oncology position. So I started looking further afield. So I was exchanging emails with Fadlo. And then I went to tell Ram to say, listen, I've not... (laughs) I haven't decided because then I had an offer to stay back in Pittsburgh as well on faculty, but I didn't want to stay there just because of all the political challenges that was going on then. So I went to tell Ram, I said, listen, this is what I'm doing. Uh, I applied to Emory and I may be going there for internet. So Ram said, oh, don't tell anyone. I'm going there too. (laughs) So it ended up that Ram was actually already far ahead of me in making the move in making the plan to come here. So it just sort of felt like a good fit. He was already here. So when I eventually came down for interview, Ram already started on faculty here and uh, that facilitated my decision to come here. And of course, not finding an academic position in Maryland made it easier for me to convince my wife that, you know, going to Emory is our best option at this point. So that was how we ended up here. (laughs) I think it worked out well for you. Yeah. How has Atlanta been for raising a family there? 
it's been very, very conducive to, you know, raising the family. It's cosmopolitan. We have a lot of people that we share things in common. People are generally friendly. And I think the kids find the multicultural nature of the city to be very welcoming. I wouldn't trade it for anything else at this point. It couldn't have gone any better. And fortunately, even my wife that wanted to go to Maryland at this point doesn't even want to leave Atlanta to go anywhere else. (laughs) That works out well. I know Atlanta is very diverse, but you've lived and worked in a lot of settings. You mentioned that you really didn't encounter any issues in Germany, but I imagine that along the way, in all the places you've been, you may have encountered some patients and possibly professional colleagues who mm-hmm. may have made you feel less welcome than you should have been. Have you been fortunate enough to avoid all that, or have you had some resistance along the way? So I think I will answer that two ways. One is, you know, the only thing I would say may be negative when I was in Germany, but I didn't take that to mean anything about German because... Growing up in Nigeria, which is also multicultural, multi-ethnic society, I've been very sensitized to the fact that people are different and people will see the same thing and have different opinion. You know, my dad was a politician. So growing up, I had the privilege of following him around, attending political meetings. And like I always tell people, if you do politics for the right reason, it's actually one of the best things you can do to you know, help people if you do it for the right reasons. And that will also allow you to understand human beings for what we all are. You know, we all have our prejudices and biases and opinions. So when I was in, there was this young attending when I was in Germany, you know, who just maybe for lack of exposure, I was like a teaching assistant to the director then. You know, I was doing that just to make extra money during my stay there. So I would go there, make sure the class is ready, get the student in and out and, you know, arrange for the slides and everything as as needed for the lecture. So this young guy was, you know, presenting one day and he just started using the N-word. And I was the only black guy in the audience, right? You know, the moment he said that the whole room, like, went silent, I saw him and I just looked at him like, like, you know, that would not make me have a different impression of everybody else. That was just you. That would probably be the only thing I would say came close to anything racist when I was in Germany. And since I've been here, to be candid, I've not, maybe I'm just blind to it, or maybe I rationalize it, but I wouldn't say I've had any problem of overt racism. In fact, if you can think of anything close to that, it was actually, unfortunately, one of my own patients, who is black, by the way, (laughs) right? Who just wasn't doing well and thought that there could be something else that we could do. And, you know, asking for impossible, like somebody with widely metastatic disease, asking for surgery, and I sent him back to the surgeon. They told him, no, we can't do surgery. And So we just went on and on and on and on. And at some point, it just got so difficult. He started, you know, using cuss word in the clinic, shouting. And I said, this is just not going well. So I had to call the clinic administrator to say, you know, this is unacceptable. Not to my face, but behind me. So they came out and said, oh, you know, he actually said he wanted an American doctor. He doesn't want all these foreign trained doctors, right? And I said, be my guest. That is fine. But unfortunately, if you want an American, you probably need to leave Emory because if you don't take <laughs> me, you take Fadlo, you take Ram, you take Rathi. <laughs> who, who else do you want to take? There is, <laughs> there is no such American born doctor that you are looking for. So eventually he left, he went to another, which I felt bad. First, I actually felt really bad that, you know, I wish we could have helped him to see things better. But you know, there are some of my patients who come into the clinic. I had a patient, very nice guy, you know, he would put his MAGA hat on and, you know, we joke and the wife would be like, oh, I'm so sorry. I told him not to wear it. I said, what's the big deal? That is what he, there's nothing wrong with it. That is him. Why should he pretend to be something that he's not? Right. And, you know, he would come and we joke and we would uh, talk about everything. Even when he was going to hospice, you know, he would come with his MAGA hat. And, you know, the last time he was in clinic, he gave me a big hug. It's like, you know, I really appreciate what you've done for me. And the wife was crying and all whatnot. So you just have to have 
you have to be open-minded, be large-hearted to know that we are all different and our biases will influence us one way or the other. As long as people respect the boundary, it can be whatever you want to be, as long as that doesn't, you know, uh, compromise or overstep the boundary of other people. You know, I don't have any problem with that. That's a good attitude. You have a lot of responsibilities now. In addition to caring for patients and running the phase one trial program at Emory that has been growing, you mentor trainees, you run regional educational programs, and now you're the ASCO lung cancer track leader for the coming year and the chair elect for the ASCO educational committee. There's just so much going on. Do you always want to be doing so much or are there aspects that are more gratifying that you want to focus more on and maybe pull away from some of these activities just because there's only 24 hours in a day? Yeah, that is, you know, that's a question I ask myself every day these days. And, you know, at times they say, if you want something done and done fast, give it to somebody who's busy. I think that is probably what is going on. You know, a lot of the things that I'm engaged in other than my direct professional responsibilities came out of prior participation in other programs. For instance, I'm privileged to be invited by the ASCO president-elect to come and help run the education program for the 2021 meeting. But how did she come to find me or to decide to offer such a responsibility to me? It's because when I participated in the ASCO leadership program, she was my mentor. So she was the mentor for my team and we worked very well together. She got to know me and perhaps recognize some positive attitudes and potential in me. So when the opportunity came, she reached out and said, you know, I don't know. I know you're very busy, so you don't have to do this, uh, but I would really like for you to help do this for the association. I said, you know, there is no greater honor than your for your mentor to recognize that you have the potential to do something such as this, given the enormity of the responsibility. So you get to the point where you have to ask, am I doing this for me or am I doing it for others? And in terms of what I said for myself in, as career goals, I think personally speaking, I've been successful in terms of what I said for myself to achieve. And the question is, at some point, you have to turn around and say, how much more do you need to do for yourself versus do for others? And I think that is really the mode in which I am now, where I try to evaluate what I do and see how impactful is it. You know, it doesn't matter how many more publications I get at this point. It doesn't really change anything for me. But if I can use my experience and knowledge up to this point to help another person get to that stage in their own career too, that will be more fulfilling to me. So a lot of things that I do these days, fortunately, I get invited to do a lot of things, but it's not everything I say yes to. I just put them on the pedestal of, if I do this, what is the impact? And if I feel that, there is a good opportunity for this to be impactful beyond just my own immediate environment. I will gladly sign up for it. But you have to find a balance, you know, as you alluded to, uh, because we only have so much time in, in a 24-hour period. You have to balance your family needs, your own personal needs, because our health is wealth. Finally, let's turn a bit to Small Cell, where you have been one of the people who has dedicated a good part of your career to study of this challenging setting, even within the field of thoracic oncology that has had its issues and difficulties in moving forward until very recently. Just in the last year or so, we've seen a couple of positive trials showing a survival benefit in first line with immunotherapy. And I'm interested in whether you see small cell as a field where you think we're going to continue to have major challenges in advancing beyond this, where it's still been pretty modest benefits for subsets of patients and will continue to be a difficult nut to crack, or whether you see the couple of positive trials we've gotten as a turning point where we're going to keep moving forward on a much faster trajectory than we've had over the last decade. 
What do you see as small cell being like over the next 10 years? Yeah, so I, for me personally, when I look at small cell, I see the glass as half full, not half empty. I always say that small cell suffers from two things. One is that it's located in the lung, just like non-small cell, and therefore we always hold it to the same standard as non-small cell. Whereas if you had been comparing small cell to maybe sarcoma or to melanoma or something, we might say, oh, well, we've made some advances. At least we have disease that responds to some treatment. But having said that, I believe that the small benefit, but important benefit that we've seen with immunotherapy for this disease helps to crack open that door so that we at least have a toehold of something new that we can then build upon. I would be greatly surprised, at least based on some of the data that is now coming out, if 10 years from now, we do not have small cell treatment based on subset of this disease. Because I'm certain and convinced that small cell is not one disease. And that until we crack that door open to say, we can't treat everybody the same. It's almost like treating an out positive patient with EGFR inhibitor and we say they're not responding which is what we're doing now. But with some of the emerging data in terms of the different subset of small cell, we might be on the verge of turning small cell into a multitude of smaller subsets that we have to treat differently. And hopefully that will also offer us the opportunity to use more targeted approach that will be effective and carry less toxicity for those patients. Taufi, thank you so much for your time. There's so much uh, going on in your past history and so many things you're doing right now. I, I just think it's amazing. So I look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. Take care. Thank you so much, Jack. It's been an honor. Thanks for listening. The West Wind Podcast is a Beacon Medical Interchange production with sound engineering and distribution by Mark Lindsay of Talking Speaker. We hope you'll be motivated to subscribe, whether at beaconmedic.com, through iTunes, or through another podcast service. Please also rate it, and I hope you'll be inclined to tell friends and colleagues in real life and on social media. We're always happy to get your suggestions and other input at westwindpodcast at gmail.com. Talk to you again soon.